intrinsic SAR. And then we're going to do some live coding. So if you want to take part in the live coding and, and follow along, um, <clears throat> you can clone the re repo. And uh, after you do check out this branch, and you'll have sort of a skeleton uh, code base uh, that we're going to work from when we start the live coding. Let's see, I'm going <clears> to <throat> grab that now while I'm talking. Um, so my name is uh, Jack Mott. I'm about to start a new job at uh, Olo. We'll be doing F sharp there mostly, not Rust, but I do uh, Rust stuff in my spare time for fun. These are a couple of uh, crates I've published in Rust. They both uh, relate to SIMD. There's a SIMD library and then a noise library that uses the SIMD library. So feel free to check those out. All right, so <clears throat> what is SIMD? SIMD stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data. The idea being that you can run a single instruction on many values at once. So rather than adding uh, a plus B, you can add four, eight, 16 copies of A plus B all at once. I've listed here some common SIMD instruction sets. On uh, ARM CPUs, there's Neon, and there's also a, a new one coming out soon, I think, called SVE. Uh, these are all Intel SIMD instruction sets, uh, <coughs> going from oldest to newest. Um, as you go to the newer instruction sets, you get uh, more functions available and wider lanes. So when you get up to AVX2, you get twice as wide of a lane. You get 256 bits instead of 128, which means you could do operations on, for instance, eight 32-bit floats at once instead of only four. And AVX512 doubles again. So what kind of things can you speed up with SIMD? Um, these first three are the things people normally think of, kind of math heavy things like physics and financial calculations and graphics. Uh, but you can also speed up uh, various kinds of parsing and text searching operations. So if you're familiar with Rust, you've probably heard of RipGrep, which is just a new, faster version of grep. And some of the ways it speeds up its uh, text searching is with SIMD operations. And you can also speed up really mundane things like memcopy. Uh, which is just copying data from one array to another because you can copy bigger chunks at a time. So basically anything that's not too branchy, uh, there's a potential you could speed it up with SIMD instructions. So we have, um, even if you're focusing only on Intel CPUs, you have all of these instruction sets to choose from. Um, how do you decide which one to target? If, if you want to make uh, code that you're going to distribute to other people and have it run optimally on any system, then you may have to write multiple versions of, of your code. So if you had some function that was in a hot path and you wanted uh, it to run everywhere, you might have to write an SSC2 version, uh, an AVX version, an AVX512 version for it to be optimal everywhere, or use some library that can do that for you. Uh, but if you only want to pick one, um, SSE2 is a nice choice. Um, it is supported on every 64-bit CPU uh, out there. So um, Rust already emits SSE2 instructions by default when you compile things. So it's totally safe to add SSE2 intrinsics in any Rust program that you're compiling uh, for 64-bit. The other nice thing is SSE2 instructions don't cause any throttling on the CPU. When you move up to AVX or AVX2, um, when you start using those instructions, the CPU may throttle the core that they're running on or depending on the instructions you're using, it might throttle the entire chip. Um, so when you use AVX, you have to be a little bit more careful that you're doing big enough chunks of AVX to work for it to be worth that throttling, because it could be possible that you can slow things down overall if you're only using uh, small chunks of AVX instructions at a time. So if you have to pick one, SSD2 is a nice, uh, safe choice. So how can a programmer leverage the, these SIMD instructions that you have on your CPU? Um, <clears throat> what we'd all like to be the case is to just have the compiler figure it out. And that's a process called auto vectorization. That's where a compiler will, compiler, compiler will take your code and automatically figure out how to use SIMD instructions to do uh, multiple things at a time. So for instance, this function here uh, that just sums an array of integers most compilers, most C compilers and the Rust compiler will figure out how to auto-vectorize this for you, no problem. So that's just going to work. 
However, if you use floating point values, compilers are not free to auto vectorize floating point map because doing so will change the answer a little bit. Floating point map is not commutative. It's not necessarily less accurate. In fact, a function like this would be more accurate uh, summed up with SIMD, but compilers are not allowed to change the result you get um, to perform optimizations. So they won't do it by default. You can tell some compilers um, that it's okay. You can pass a, a flag in C compilers called uh, F fast math. And when you do that, then functions like this would get auto vectorized. In Rust, there's no way to do that currently, at least not easily. And even with C compilers, it is sometimes complicated because you might not want your entire program uh, to have floating point uh, values changed. Um, you might only want particular functions. And it can be compiler specific whether you can apply that flag to specific chunks of code. Another problem is you can <coughs> really quickly break the auto vectorization. If you have something, uh, a branch like this in your code, it's very unlikely that any compiler is gonna, going to auto vectorize it, though you could still do it uh, by hand. You still could speed this up by hand with intrinsics or assembly. So another approach is to, uh, rather than just writing normal code and hoping the compiler will figure it out, is to carefully massage your code until the compiler will figure it out. So this example here is equivalent to this code here, uh, but it removes the branches. And it does that by calculating a bit mask based on the condi condition, and then selecting the answer we want, either ints of i or negative ints of i, into the result. And when you do this, you have to compute both results of your branch and select the right one. So there's a little performance set because you're doing more computation, but when you're doing SIMD, you can do a lot of computation at a time. So it's usually a net win, or as often a net win. You can also use assembler to do intrinsics, of course, and that gives you complete control, uh, not only over the instructions you use, uh, but also how you manage registers. Another option is to use libraries that try to make using SIMD easier. Um, so one that exists in Rust is called Faster, and it'll let you write code like this that looks relatively uh, normal. You can use iterators and map and fold and so on, uh, but all the operations inside will be vectorized. Uh, so libraries like this are really nice in that they make it easier to do these things and your code looks uh, more normal, um, but uh, you lose some control. For instance, if you compiled this for an SSE2 uh, CPU, uh, the seal operation would revert to scalar. It would do one at a time for each value in the SIMD lane because there is no seal instruction in SSE2. However, if you were using raw intrinsics, there's workarounds to make this uh, pretty fast still. Uh, one point I forgot to mention about massaging your code. Um, there's some benefits to this, which is if you do it this way, when you compile your code for SSE, the compiler will uh, automatically vectorize this for SSE2 instructions. Or if you compiled it for an ARM CPU, it could automatically emit NEON instructions. Um, that way you don't have to write multiple versions of your function. You just count on the compiler uh, emitting the appropriate ones based on your compile target. The downside is if uh, <clears throat> it's possible that if you switch compilers, the massaging you've done to make it auto-vectorize uh, might no longer work. Or if you upgrade compilers, it might no longer work. Or if someone comes in and modifies your function a little bit, not realizing what you've, uh, what you've done, a small change could also break the auto-vectorization. So it's got pros and cons to doing it this way. Some people, this is their preferred way to leverage SIMD. And finally, what we'll be doing today is intrinsics. This is just a quick look at what that looks like. So let's get into intrinsics in more depth. <coughs> so what are they and, and why do we want to use them? Um, one motivation is that inline assembler is hard for compilers to deal with. This used to be the way people would do intrinsics almost all of the time. Uh, but some compilers no longer support inline assembler at all. For instance, uh, Microsoft's Visual C compiler doesn't allow that anymore. <clears throat> and uh, it can cause performance degradation in codes surrounding uh, your inline assembler. Uh, the compiler is trying to reason about how to use uh, the registers in your hardware efficiently. And when you start using registers yourself in your inline assembler, you're, you're kind of ruining the compiler's plans. So it complicates the compiler and can sometimes cause uh, harm in surrounding code. And the other motivation is managing registers by hand is, is hard for humans. You'd rather not have to uh, spend that much time writing a SIMD function. 
So intrinsics are sort of a compromise. They look like normal function calls, but they are not. Uh, there's special instructions to tell the compiler to emit certain machine instructions, but you don't have to worry about registers when you use them. The compiler will do that and is free to reason about them uh, more easily. You can still sometimes beat intrinsics by large mar margins, but they're not a similar. Uh, Dan Liu has a, a pretty cool blog in one of his entries talks about an example of that. <coughs> and a handy guide to keep uh, around whenever you're working with uh, Intel intrinsics, at least, is their uh, intrinsics guide. I'll show you what that looks like. I'm gonna pop a link in chat too. Um, so this hat over here on the left, you can filter by which instruction set you're interested in, in looking at. So for instance, we can pick uh, SSE and SSE2 and ask, okay, how do we do a multiply? So you can type in mul and you get back uh, all these uh, different intrinsics. So these things look pretty scary. They're sort of uh, cryptic looking names, uh, but they're actually very informative. So the mm prefix that you see on all these just stands for multimedia, which means you're working with a SIMD function. Uh, the original intent of these kinds of instructions used to be just for video encoding and decoding, so they called it multimedia back in the day. <coughs> the um, part in the middle tells you what operation you're doing. So in this case, multiply, if we looked at add, right, we'd see add. And the third part is what uh, type of data it's operating on. So add ps will operate on uh, single precision floating point values. Um, add pd will act on double precision floating point values. Um, EPI32 would be 32-bit integers. And then this type, the return types and the uh, input types, uh, the format is just a, a underscore underscore M128. Uh, that stands for 128 bits. That tells you how wide the value is. And then I <coughs> is used when it's integer types, D for doubles, and then when there is no letter, it's a single precision floating point. But really, you should just think of the inputs and results of SIMD instructions as just being 128 bits uh, of data. You'll frequently cast things back and forth freely. So <clears throat> here's an example uh, in Rust of how you would use them. Um, you import STD Arch to get access to the x86 intrinsics. And these are the C and C++ and C Sharp equivalents that you would import to get access to the same thing. And in C, these functions look exactly the same. They, C and Rust use the exact same syntax. Um, so in this case, uh, we're saying let A equal to set one PS, and the return type will be this M128. And what that looks like in memory is just an array. It's just a, a, a chunk of contiguous data, 128 bits wide. Um, so an M128 reset uh, everything to 2.0 would look just like this, look like an array with two point zeros in it. Um, uh, set PS one, two, three, four. So in this case, we're setting different values in each lane. Um, in memory, it'll be backwards, four, three, two, one. And that's just because Intel is a little, little Indian. So that's something to keep in mind because sometimes you will do SIMD stuff and then try to access actual uh, individual lanes. You need to keep in mind it'll be, it'll be backwards. And then to do an add, you can just use the add instruction with your A and your B and you get back some result and it'll look like that in memory. Just the addition of each lane. One of, or it's all done at once, but you get the addition of each lane. And then AVX2 is just a wider instruction set, works the same way. So you would get, uh, if you're using 32-bit integers, um, you would get eight twos instead of four. All right, so let's move on to some coding. And if you, if you just joined, you can grab uh, the repo I'll, I'll paste this stuff in chat too. Let's, let's try that one line at a time. Grab that repo and then check out that branch. And you'll be good to go. And we're going to start in <coughs> the vectors folder. And first thing we're going to do is fix a bug in the benchmarks. Oh, no, that's not in this file. That'll be the next one. Okay. So we're going to have a, a, a 
scenario here, it'll be similar to a, a game or a physics simulation, but whichever you prefer, you can think of it like that. We're gonna have a bunch of entities. Uh, each entity will have a name, a position, and a velocity, and then some other data associated with it. Mass, elasticity, strength, etc. Uh, positions and velocities will be represented by a vector three. This is X, Y, and Z float 32s. And what we're going to be doing is some operations on all of our entities. So one of the operations we're going to do is we're going to move them around. So every tick of the simulation or every frame of the game, we're going to add the entity's velocity to its position and change its positions. So uh, I've set up a little uh, sort of vector trait here. This has some common operations that uh, vector libraries tend to have. Um, for now, just add and normalize. So adding two vectors just adds each component together to get you a new vector. Uh, normalize, what that does is it uh, computes the length of the vector and <clears throat> divides each component by that length. And that returns a new vector that points in the same direction, uh, but uh, has a, a length of one or unit length. These are common operations you, you would use if you were doing uh, games or physics simulations. <clears throat> and we have a benchmark set up where we're going to take a hundred thousand entities. We're going to create 100,000 random entities with random positions and random velocities. And we're going to iterate over every entity and add each entity's velocity to its position and see how long it takes. And we're going to do the same thing with uh, SIMD instructions to see what we get. So <clears throat> the way um, many people start to think about uh, SIMD, the first approach they take, um, will be very similar to what we're going to do here. So we see here we've got three add operations all in a row. And we know that SIMD can let us do, uh, if we use SSE uh, intrinsics, we know that we can do uh, four adds all at once. So we could do all three of these adds with one instruction instead of two. So that seems like a good idea. So let's try and do that and see if we can speed up uh, this code. Um, so we're gonna add um, self or add V to self. So first thing we need to do is we need to take our X, Y, and Z values and put them into a, a SIMD register. So we can use uh, the set operation. And we don't need the fourth value at all, so we're just going to fill that in with a zero. So we're going to do uh, <coughs> same thing with V. And we're going to add them together. And that's simple enough. So now we have a, a result that's going to be a plus b, a plus b for x, y, and z, and so on. Uh, but we need to store this value uh, back into x. Because the way our add function works is we're adding v to um, self. So how can we do that? We've got this simd value. How do we break it down into the x, y, and z components to store it? Um, so one thing you can do is you can use transmute because remember our SIMD value is actually just equivalent to an array of four 32-bit floats. So we can use transmute to turn our M128 into an array of four floats. And we'll say result array. So now this is just reinterpreting the result as an array. This will all compile away. It doesn't have any cost. And remember that <coughs> the data is, is backwards. So even though we said x, y, z here, we're going to get a memory from 3, 2, 1 instead of 0, 1, 2. All right, so that's it. We, we set our A, we set our B, do the add operation, reinterpret it as an array so we can store it back in our vector three struct. All right, so let's benchmark that. We can run cargo bench to run our benchmarks. It's right now compiling the uh, benchmarking library, so that'll take a little bit of time. If anyone has any questions uh, so far, feel free to hop into chat. Let me know.
perhaps we could speed up the Rust compiler with SIMD. Uh, so someone in chat asks, is transmuted, uh, transmuting the recommended way or is there an into implementation as well? Um, I'll actually show you a, a better way of, of handling this particular scenario where you're trying to store the results in just a minute. But there are times when you need to access individual lanes of a, of a SIMD value. And either uh, using transmute to interpret it as an array or using a union. Um, so you can do a, a, a union like... Uh, something like this, where you have M128 and then 32 by four. Um, so what, what this does in Rust is it makes, it's like a struct, except S and A overlap. So uh, it's either an M128 or an array. So if you store an M128 in there, you can also just refer to the A if you wanna treat it like an array, so you can go back and forth. So either transmuting or using a union is usually the way to access individual lanes when you need to. But I'll show you a better way of storing data uh, back in just a minute. Okay, so our benchmark is done. Um, so we ran it both for the scalar move where you do things one at a time and our SSE2 move. And you'll notice the time for scalar move was 410 microseconds, SSE was 687 microseconds. So that's actually worse. So this is no good. And the reason why is that putting these values one by one into these SIMD values is taking up more time than we save by doing only one add operation and also getting them out one by one. <coughs> so this is no good. Um, but there's some uh, worse problems than just this. We, we might be able to do some trickery to speed this up. Or if we were doing a lot of math here um, around these loads and stores, we might still get some benefit. Uh, but what if we wanted to do an AVX add? Right? If we did AVX, we would have um, eight lanes to deal with, but only three things to put in them still. So we would not be leveraging AVX at all if we wanted to, to do it this way. Um, another problem is if we wanted to implement and normalize with this approach, we see that there's three multiplies here. So we can multiply, <coughs> um, do those three multiplies with the SIMD instruction and end up with a SIMD value with X squared, Y squared, Z squared, and zero in it. Uh, but then we need to add those together, right? We need to add the individual lanes together. So that we'd have to do one at a time or do a few tricky SIMD instructions uh, to do it. It's, it's not, there's not a very efficient way to do it. And then once we get the result, right? Um, then we need to run a square root operation on just the result of this, right? Just a single value. And square root is probably the most expensive, it is the most expensive operation in the normalize. And we don't have any way to vectorize it if we use this approach, right? We're only running it on one value. So this totally breaks down for normalized. It's not gonna work out well at all. So let's look at a, uh, a better way of doing this. So we're gonna open up the other folder in here, vectors SOA. <clears throat> and here's where we're gonna fix a bug. So if you go to the benchmarks, there's one benchmark here that is incorrect. This should be SSD underscore norm. So make that fix. <clears throat> okay. So what we're going to do here is lay out our data completely differently. Because what we don't want to do is uh, try to look at our function, look at our add function, and see repeated operations and try to apply the SIMD to that. What we want to do instead is apply um, use SIMD to execute our entire function multiple times. Right? So instead of trying to do the three adds in, inside the function all at once. We'll want to try to execute add four times each time we run add. Uh, but in order to do that, we also need 
all of our data to be in order in memory, right? Because we're going to need to operate on multiple vectors and positions or multiple velocities and positions at the same time. And we need to line those up in memory. So in order to do that, we're going to restructure things. So instead of having an entity struct and a vector struct, we're going to turn them into plural forms, right? So we have an entities struct, which will contain um, uh, vex or arrays of all of our entities. And the vectors struct will have arrays of x, y, and z. <coughs> so now the velocities <coughs> will all be in uh, basically arrays of x, y, and z. And the positions will be in arrays of x, y, and z. And this pattern is often called, uh, you'll, you'll hear the term SOA, which stands for uh, struct of arrays, <coughs> rather than arrays of structs. And it's a, it's a common technique um, to improve performance in general, um, not just for SIMD, but it's especially helpful for um, making it easier to use uh, SIMD uh, instructions on things. And we'll see why in just a minute. Um, this arrangement does add some complexity uh, to some kinds of operations you do. For instance, if we wanted to remove a single entity from our system, we can't just remove the one struct, right? We have to remove uh, these items from all these arrays, right? So that gets more complicated. But there are sort of systems and libraries for dealing with that problem. Um, entity component systems, for instance, is sort of a, a type of thing that would let you do this and, and manage that difficulty. But other, other operations get easier. So we'll, we'll see what the net benefit looks like. Um, so I've got the regular scalar add implemented already. So let's just do a benchmark so we know what we're going to start from. And again, it's going to compile. I apologize. Any other questions while this compiles? So while this is compiling, I'll mention there's, there's different strategies to um, lay this data out. For instance, you could still have an entity struct where there's just a single name, a single mass, a single elasticity, and a single strength. Um, <clears throat> but pull out the positions and vectors into uh, a separate array. And then the entity would just contain an index into the position and vector and velocity arrays. Um, that can help keep most of your code simple and you just do this SOA approach with the data that you're going to be iterating over uh, and really need the performance on. So there's, there's different ways to rearrange this. So we're benchmarking just this function right now. And you'll notice now that our data is uh, lined up differently, uh, the position and uh, velocity vectors are actually arrays of vectors now. So we have to iterate over all of them and add them up. All right, <clears throat> we're done. And notice it took only 230 microseconds. All right, the same benchmark on the previous example took 400 microseconds. So we've already sped things up a lot. It's almost twice as fast, and we haven't done any SIMD yet. So why is that happening? So the reason is, uh, previously, when we were iterating over all of our entities, um, our entity in memory would have looked something like this. There's the name pointer. X, Y, Z for the position, X, Y, Z for velocity, and then mass, elasticity, strength. Right, the entity had all this data, uh, <coughs> entity struct was all this data lined up in, in memory. And we were iterating over this entire chunk of memory, but the only thing we actually were accessing were these X, Y, and Zs. So what happens when your CPU is requesting uh, data from memory is it will pull in a big chunk at a time because getting data from RAM is slow. It pulls a big chunk of it at a time into the CPU's caches, and the caches are, by comparison to RAM, very, very fast. And when you're, when you're iterating over a big chunk like this, you might not be able to fit all of the data into your cache line anymore. So when you're <coughs> going from one entity's uh, position to the next entity's position, uh, it's not ready in the cache, and it has to request it from RAM, which is really slow. And you're also stressing out the memory throughput 
uh, of your hardware more. So you can run at the memory throughput limits where you're requesting data faster than the, the RAM can supply. So because of those reasons, this is already going faster because we are only iterating over these arrays of our vectors. We're only uh, looking at the memory we actually need. Everything is lined up in the CPU's L1 cache. So everything kind of just comes through in instantly. So <clears throat> by doing this slightly weird arrangement of our data, we've already sped things up by a factor of two without even having to do any SIMD code. Another benefit to this is that if this were integers, or if we could pass the fast math flag to the Rust compiler, this would probably get auto vectorized. This is a very, very obvious auto vectorization case. So we'd probably get SIMD for free too, uh, if we could do that, right? If you're doing this in C, for instance, you could pass the fast math flag, this would get auto vectorized. And that would be really cool. But we can't do that here. Um, so we're gonna do it by hand to see what we can, uh, what kind of performance we can get. So the trick here, is that we are going to iterate over all of our uh, entities or of our, our, our vectors, but we're going to do um, we're going to do our add operation on four at a time. So we can step by four, right? I from zero to x that length. Step by four. That's going to uh, jump ahead four times, uh, four spots in the array each time. And we're going to do <coughs> we have to load up um, all of our X, Y, and Z arrays from both the velocity and position uh, into memory. So instead of uh, using the set operation like we did before, we're going to use load u ps. And what this wants is a, a pointer to some memory, and it will take uh, 128 bits from the start of your pointer on. And so one way you could do that is you could take your self.x array at the index you're at and just get a reference to it. That will work, but a downside to that is when you access arrays uh, this way in Rust, it's going to do an array bounds check, right? Rust is a safe language, so there's going to be a, <clears throat> a check to make sure that I is actually in the bounds of the array, and that will slow things down a little bit. And the whole point of this is to go fast. And also, um, the SIMD intrinsics are already unsafe. You'll notice the unsafe here. Um, so we might as well use a faster unsafe method called get unchecked. And all this does is do an array index, gives you back a, a pointer to that index without doing the array bounds check. All right, so that's an unsafe function, but so is load UPS anyway. So let's go ahead and do it. So we're gonna do the same thing for Y and Z. We do this whole thing for the velocity as well. Okay, so now we've loaded up our X, Y's, and Z's. And something to keep in mind is these load operations are basically, they basically compile away. It's equivalent to casting your array to an, MM, to an M128 type, All right? So nothing is actually hap happening here. It's just a clue to the compiler that you're gonna be treating um, AX as an M128 type, right? It's, it's equivalent to doing a transmute. Uh, the only uh, caveat to that is you'll notice it says, uh, we say load u here. There's also a load instruction without the u. The u stands for um, unaligned. And it used to be on older CPUs, you needed to align your arrays on specific boundaries, depending on the instruction set to get good performance. And <clears throat> so if you wanted to use load to get the very best performance on old CPUs, you would need to align your array on certain memory boundaries and then use the load instruction instead of load u. So this does sort of clue the compiler in to whether your data is aligned or not. <clears throat> and I should, I should note on, on newer CPUs, the performance penalty for unaligned loads is very small. Most people don't worry about it now, but you could. Okay, so now we have uh, <clears throat> our A and Bs. So now we want our results. Um, And we just do our add operation like before on AX and BX. And we'll do 
y z. And now we need to store our results. And this time we're not going to do that uh, transmute trick. Instead, we're going to uh, use the store operation. So this is the counterpart to load. And this basically says you can put the data that's in the SIMD register we've computed back into uh, some array. So we can use the uh, get unchecked again, except this time we need to use get unchecked mute because we are modifying the value. That's a mutable version of get unchecked. And then we put the value we're going to store there. And we're done. So this is our SSE version of add. And at first glance, it doesn't look promising because there's so much code here compared to, compared to this. Uh, but keep in mind that these, uh, these loads <coughs> and, and stores basically compile away and that we're operating on four of our entities at a time. So let's bench this and see what happens. So we're going to go uncomment out the SSE move. And run cargo bench. All right, so now we see we've gone from 230 microseconds for the scalar move to 62 microseconds for the SSE move. All right, so that's a, a pretty huge improvement. Uh, pretty close to 4x, 4x faster. So that's a much, much better result than <coughs> the, the old attempt where we did uh, uh, the non SOA approach. So other benefits we get with this approach, um, aside from the huge speed up here, is now we can do uh, normalize properly. So let's look at um, SSE norm. I'm going to actually copy this up under here. So let's see what normalize looks like when we do it this way. Uh, we can start out with the same code as we did in add. Stepping by four, and we're going to load up self into A. And then we need to calculate the uh, length. And we're going to do a bunch of multiplies this time. We're going to get A squared, B squared. I'm sorry, Y squared. And then we're going to add these all up. Okay, so that's getting the sum of all the squares. And then final step is square root. <clears throat> and then we're going to want to um, store um, self.x divided by length. So we're going to do self.x that get unchecked mute and i. And then we'll do the division. That's just div underscore ps. Uh, AX length, and the same thing for Y and Z. This should be square root PS. All right, so we're just computing uh, AX divided by length, AY divided by length, AZ divided by length, and then storing that back into self. And then we need to close our loop. Okay, and that's it. <clears throat> Normalize is a lot smaller because we're only dealing uh, with the velocity, not with the position as well. Let's look at the performance of this. So we're going to compare the scalar normalize to the SSE normalize. Okay, so we see here scalar norm took 422 microseconds versus just 99 microseconds um, for SSE2. So again, around a 4x improvement.
that's really good. Remember before we couldn't really implement this at all with the old approach, but once you line up your data in memory and can <clears throat> uh, work on uh, four vectors at a time, you can, you can screen through it really fast. Um, there's an additional trick you can do here. So <clears throat> in normal Rust code, there is no, um, there is a square root function available, but in the SIMD intrinsics, there is a reciprocal square root function available. So this is gonna compute one over the square root instead of the square root. Um, that function is not available in Rust. You could probably create one from first principles, but with the SIMD intrinsics, it's right there ready to go. And what's the, what this lets us do is we can convert these divs to multiplies and multiplies are faster than divs. So we can get another performance boost from that. All right, and now we're down to 67 microseconds when it was uh, around 99 before. So going really fast now. <clears throat> so that's all cool, uh, but these are pretty easy things to SIMDFI. What if we throw a wrench in our plans by adding a branch to our logic? So we're gonna try doing this on a new function uh, called clamp, and clamp is gonna operate a lot like normalize, except that what we're gonna do is if a uh, vector is less than a minimum length, then we're gonna make it equal to that minimum length, right? So the vectors will be unchanged unless they're less than this, then they will be made equal to min. Right, so the what, way we can do that is we uh, <coughs> calculate the length, check if the length is less than min. If it is, then we <coughs> uh, create a multiplier where we can multiply our components by that multiplier to make them equal to length. Otherwise, we leave it alone. So let's see how we can do that. We're gonna start out with our normalized code. We'll just copy and paste that into Clint. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we're not gonna want the reciprocal square root here because we need to uh, uh, figure out what the actual, actual length is. So with SIMD code, there's no way to have an actual if statement that makes sense, right? Because each lane might take a different path through the if statement. So what we need to do is compute both results um, and then select the ones we want. So we're gonna have a uh, true result. So if result is less than min, then we need to compute this uh, multiplier, right? One over length uh, times min. So let's do that. Let's do uh, div ps. So set one, we'll put a one in every lane. So we're gonna divide one by length. And then multiply that by min. And let's do, uh, <clears throat> we're gonna need a Let min simd. So we can't uh, do math with single floating point values on our simd values. So we need to set uh, min into every lane of a simd value. So we'll have min simd available here. <clears throat> so we'll do one over length and then multiply by min simd. So that'll be our multiplier if it's true. Um, let's actually go ahead and make a one here. <clears throat> so we can use that both spots. This won't actually matter from a performance perspective. Set one is kind of uh, also compiles away the way load does, but it may maybe makes it a little easier to read. So our false result, if, we're, if our vector is not less than min in size, uh, then we're just gonna do, uh, So that'll, that will not change the vector at all when we multiply it. And then lastly, we need a mask. So we need a bit mask that tells us uh, which ones to pick. So SIMD does have comparison operators, which might seem weird at first, uh, but what it will do is return a, a bit mask uh, saying true or false for whether the condition is true or not. So we're gonna wanna know if len is less than uh, min simd. 
So this stands for compare less than floating point, right? Single position floating point. So this mask will look something uh, uh, like this in memory, right? It's going to be <clears throat> uh, okay. The first on the first lane uh, length is less than min, then it's not, then it is, then it's not. And that mask we can use to then select uh, the true or false results into a, sim, a final SIMD result. And the way we can do that is with a bunch of bitwise operations. So it's going to look like this. We're going to do an OR. And then we're going to end the mask with the true result. And end not the mask with the false result. And what and not does is it first applies a not to the mask and then does an and. <clears throat> so what this is going to do is select um, the proper result for each lane into result. At which point we can then <clears throat> multiply by result. Okay, so we have to do a little bit of extra work here because we are uh, we're having to compute both results, right? We're having to compute the uh, true result every single time, whereas the scalar code only has to do it um, if length is actually less than min. So let's see if we get a net speed up or not. Oh, I need to turn on those benchmarks first. Scalar clamp, SSE clamp. <clears throat> okay, so the scalar clamp is 170 microseconds, and our SSE clamp is 101 microseconds. So we did get a speed up, even though we had to do um, more computation, right? So that's pretty good. And that's how you deal with, uh, with branches. Uh, but let's see if we can do it a little better. So let's do an AVX version of the same thing. So remember, AVX is just a newer instruction set, and it can hold uh, 256 bits instead of 128. And <clears throat> that'll be eight floating point values at a time. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to move, change the step by four to step by eight. And then we're going to do a little search and replace. Again, selection only. We replace all of our MMs with MM two fifty sixes. And it's not quite that easy. <clears throat> Some of the operations in AVX two work differently. So instead of compare less than, uh, the way AVX two works is there's just a compare operation that takes a flag. And let me show you what those flags look like. This is why this uh, Intel Intrinsics Guide is so handy. So we can type in compare and see, okay, how does this work? So it takes this IMM8 flag, and this is a list of all the possible flags. So <clears throat> these basically tell you whether you want to do a, a check for equality, less than, uh, greater than, and so on, greater than or equal. And the bit at the end here is just uh, tells the CPU how you want to deal with cases like NAND. Right, or there's not a real answer to the question. It's just different options for that. Uh, for us, it doesn't matter. So we'll just use uh, compare less than OS. All right, so that's our compare. And so let's, let's, let's benchmark this and see what we get. And unmark the final benchmark, AVX clamp. Okay, you'll see that the, the benchmark failed. And why did it fail? So there's actually two things that can happen here, depending on what the compiler does. This could actually run successfully, but be really slow. And the reason why is by default, when you build a Rust program, it does not target an AVX2 CPU. 
It only targets one that has SSE2 instructions or older. And so even though you've done AVX2 intrinsics, the compiler is not going to emit them. So sometimes it will downgrade your code to scalar code. Uh, sometimes it will just not work. So one way you can fix that is you can compile your code. Um, when you, when you, <clears throat> you can set compiler options to tell it to target an AVX2 CPU, then this will work. Another thing you can do is you can tag a specific function to use AVX2 instructions. And the reason this is useful is you might want your program to use AVX2 instructions when the customer uh, has them. Otherwise, you might want it to use SSE2 instructions. And when that's the case, you don't want the compiler emitting AVX2 instructions over all of your code, or your program won't want to run at all on an SSE2 customer's computer. When you do it this way, only this function gets AVX2 instructions, and at runtime, you can decide to either call this function or this function. So let's run the benchmark again with that turned on. All right, so now we see the <coughs> scalar clamp, 169 microseconds, SSE 110, and then with AVX, we've about doubled it. But there's more. So this um, big mess we have to do to select results, um, starting with SSE 4, a new instruction was added called blend that uh, lets you kind of do this in one step. And that looks like this. False result goes first, which is counterintuitive. Right, so it's the exact same approach, um, but you can do it with a single intrinsic and you may get better, better performance depending on your CPU. Uh, oh, 256 for AVX2. So it can help clean up your code at least and you may get a little bit better performance too. So let's give it a try. So we had 65 before. So in this case, <clears throat> we get a 22% performance improvement with blend. So that's something to keep in mind if you're targeting uh, SSE 4.1, I think, or higher, is you can use these blend operations to do uh, handle conditionals more efficiently. <clears throat> All right, so um, last detail, I mentioned that you can uh, select at runtime which functions to use. So Rust has a really nice feature um, you can say if is x86 feature detected, you can do stuff like this. This uh, built in is x86 feature detected function is really handy. It, it lets you really easily. Um, oh, it's a macro. Uh, it's really handy. In other languages like C, um, every compiler has a different way of doing this, and sometimes you have to write a similar to do it. Um, so you can really easily tell like what CIMD instructions that you have available um, with this macro, and then at runtime, uh, select the thing you want to do, which is really handy. All right, so that is basically it. Um, this is enough to get you going to do whatever SIMD stuff you want to do. Uh, <clears throat> it's always useful to keep this thing open uh, when you're working on stuff to see what functions you have available to try and find efficient ways to do things. Um, one of the things that is hard about SIMD is that you might have to write multiple versions of the same function um, to target multiple CPUs. And I'm just going to show really quickly um, my Rust crate that helps with that. So this is uh, SIMDs. And what SIMDs does is use traits to let you write code one time and then produce, um, uh, at compile time, multiple versions of it, targeting different SIMD instruction sets. So you can write a function like this <coughs> uh, with a generic uh, SIMD trait. And the intrinsics all look just like the ones we've been doing, except with the MM removed, which is a, a shorter version. So you can do the same things like loads, subtract, square root, and so on. 
uh, with these values. <clears throat> and you can iterate over the, uh, the length. Um, uh, this, this here, this part of the, of the trait will tell you what the width of the SIMD lane is for a particular type. So if you're working with 32-bit floats and you want to increment by the width, uh, you can use this, which is a constant. Because if this is going to be an SSE instruction, this would be 4. If it's ABX2, that would be 8. So it lets you abstract away that difference. <clears throat> and then you can use the function uh, by calling it with a particular instruction set. right? So you can get an SSE2 version of the function uh, by calling it like so, SSE41, or ABX2. So it's a really uh, handy library that lets you write the function one time, generate all the versions at compile time, and then you can use that is86 feature detected uh, to select at runtime which one you want. All right, so that's it. Are there uh, any questions? I'll hang around in chat for a while. If people have questions or want to see anything else. Hello, Wired Life. And if you want to play with this and didn't follow along, if you just uh, clone the repo and check out the master branch, it'll have all this stuff built in already. All right, looks like no questions from chat, so I'm going to sign off. Thanks, everyone, for joining. See you later.